Hey guys, uh, this is Joelle from Edge Marketing. And before we bring in Natalie, I wanted to first thank Alberto from our support team, who's also here on the space as a speaker. Um, he actually reached out to Natalie, requesting if she could be a guest at the Edge AQ um, meetups that we have here in San Diego. So thank you, Alberto, for landing this. Um, we're so excited to have Natalie here. You're welcome. <laughs> so uh, my name is Alberto. I am in support and I help with other technical aspects here at Edge, ultimately just uh, concerned with user experience. Um, reached out to Natalie and for anybody who's been living under a rock, uh, she's an investigative journalist, a uh, podcast host, uh, overall lately has made a name for herself as an educator in the Bitcoin space. Uh, that's just a small summary, of course. She does much more than that, and she's not limited to just that. But uh, she does interview a lot of uh, prominent voices in both the Bitcoin space and economics in general. So uh, we'll hope to get into some uh, econ-related questions and uh, hopefully something a little more different than the typical Bitcoin-type questions. Uh, Joel? Yeah, for sure. We wanted to make this space different today, but of course, like for people who don't know Natalie, we want to make sure that we cover the bases. So uh, Natalie, from what I've seen in my research, <laughs> you grew up in Illinois. Uh, you studied at Pepperdine here in California, and then you did your master's at Northwestern. Um, and after that, I saw that you focused your career basically becoming a reporter. And then in 2021, you went from uh, working for Apple, I believe you had a career podcast with them and then switched over to a Bitcoin podcast, or I think you might be doing both of those at the same time right now. So would love to hear more of how you made the transition into Bitcoin, like who was um, your biggest influence or like what was that tipping point that made you want to get into crypto in general? Yeah, so first of all, I just want to say thank you so much for having me. I, I really appreciate it, and I appreciate the support that the Bitcoin community has offered me. Um, I'm just, I'm super passionate about helping educate people and spreading the word through my sort of background and skill set, which is media and simplifying the message uh, through my reporting experience that you sort of touched on. So yeah, just to give you sort of a brief summary and touch on some of the things you mentioned about my background, I am originally actually from Poland. I'm a first generation immigrant and I studied journalism and then I worked for more than 10 years at different broadcast networks. Um, so I was on a local level as well as on a national level reporting on everything from breaking news to, you know, stories about um, all the issues that are really facing society right now, public corruption, civil unrest, homelessness. Um, you know, I really got to witness all of these problems sort of ballooning in the U.S. over the last 10 years. And I, it made me really sad and, and, to be honest with you, really jaded as a reporter, especially toward politics, because I felt like no matter what election I was reporting on or what candidate or elected official I would be interviewing, I felt like the problems just got bigger even though we threw more money at the problems and every single politician would blame the next. So I kept kind of thinking in the back of my head, gosh, like what is wrong with the system? Why is America, which is supposed to be the greatest country in the world where my family you know, fled communism and wanted to come here to pursue the American dream, why is life getting harder as opposed to easier every year? Why is our money worth less as opposed to more every year? So I, um, while I was, a, uh, I was a breaking news correspondent for ABC News nationally, I would travel the country for news based in Los Angeles, though. And I started a podcast called Career Stories because I always loved hearing just backstories, origin stories of how people achieve success, what obstacles did they overcome, because I was always kind of grasping for like, just hope and positivity. You know, I'm covering tragedies and natural disasters on a daily basis. Um, and from that, you know, during that time, about 2017, I discovered Bitcoin and started to learn more about it over the last few years. And I finally, I felt like, oh my gosh, it was like an epiphany. Like, this is what's causing all the problems I'm reporting on. Like, money is the problem. Our broken monetary system has led to sort of the demise of the American dream. And so for me, I was like, I have to be a part of the solution or spreading the message on the solution. So I sort of pivoted my podcast. And instead of 
career stories, I, I named it Coin Stories, thinking honestly it would be just a temporary thing. I thought, you know, maybe I'll do a season or something like that. I'll try to get some of the biggest names in the space that I had been following and watching and listening to on podcasts and just sort of hear, you know, why do they have conviction to hopefully help, you know, spread conviction to, to others. And it really took off. I mean, there's obviously an audience and a hunger for this information and for knowledge and education. So I was fortunate enough to be able to, um, you know, I took a risk, um, but I felt like it would pay off. I, I left my job last year at the end of the year, about six months after starting the podcast. And, and now I just, I full time do the show as well as, you know, I appear on different media outlets and news shows talking about Bitcoin, offering commentary and analysis. Um, I do education webinars and seminars. So I'm just, I'm so grateful and happy. And like, I just want to help bring in people into this space and help teach them about Bitcoin. So thanks for having me. No, we're, we're, we're super happy to uh, have you. And uh, I guess this is where I'll, I'll take on the, the economics side of the, the questions here. Um, I'm curious, uh, economics, was that something that you ended up falling into based on the journalism you were doing? Or did you already always have a, uh, an ear to economics and investing and such? No, so that's a great question. I did not formally study economics, and it was actually Bitcoin that was the, the catalyst and the entry point for me to really try to understand both how our monetary system works and the history of money, because it's something we use every single day, right? But we don't really think about it. We don't even question, like, what is money or what is our money worth and why is it worth less every year, especially you know here in the United States. So um, it was through reading, actually, the Bitcoin standard that I became inspired to dig deeper and really try to understand the economic theory that's taught here in universities. I had no, I had never heard of Keynesian economics before or the Austrian school prior to literally reading the Bitcoin standard with Saifedean. And then it was like a light bulb went off and I was just hungry to understand more. And it made me really sad because, you know, I had gone to great schools and universities. My parents sacrificed so much when we immigrated here for us to be in a good uh, school district. And, you know, we were like the poorest, one of the poorest families in that area in a suburb of Chicago just so I could go to a good public school and I was never taught this I was never taught this and I went to good universities I got my master's at Northwestern I was never taught financial literacy so I think that helps me relate to a lot of people in the country because you know my job as a reporter was really taking complex topics and breaking them down synthesizing them crystallizing um, the heart of the message and sharing that with a wider public so I felt like there's a need in this space for that because there are so many brilliant minds who do have an economics and engineering background, but the average person doesn't. And I am the average person, you know? So I try to translate the message of Bitcoin to people who are not, you know, economics experts. And I've certainly learned so, so much through the process. And it's, it's funny because now I'll go out with, you know, my girlfriends who may or may not have Bitcoin out here where I live. And I'll, I'll be talking about like the Austrian school. And they're like, what is she talking about? <laughs> <laughs> I've become a total economics nerd. <laughs> I guess um, this is a good chance to ask. Uh, how, if you could explain inflation to a six-year-old, how would you go about that? Oh, gosh. Uh, <laughs> that's a great question. Um, I would say I really like the, um, I guess this isn't technically inflation, but I love the reference that Saifedean made in the Bitcoin standard about like high and low time preference of the, the mushroom experiment of, I could give you a, um, uh, the, what is it, the, um, the marshmallow experiment. I can give you one marshmallow now and you can take it, or if you wait, I will leave the room and in a couple hours I'll come back and I'll give you two uh, marshmallows. And so I always thought that there was really interesting because you had to think, like, are, do you want something immediate? Is it instant gratification or do you want something later? So I'm trying to think, like, maybe there's a marshmallow way to say um, inflation, right? So today I'm going to give you two marshmallows, but next year it's only going to be worth one <laughs> if you don't eat it right now. I don't know. <laughs> that, that, I think that's a perfect actual example. Um, yeah, that's yeah. exactly what's going on. Um, 
Yeah, so if you, uh, hold, if you don't eat the two marshmallows now and you hold on to it, um, they're, it's just going to be worth one. I mean, I, I, it's funny <laughs> trying good. to explain some of these topics to, to children. Um, but, but, you know, I think we do need to kind of dumb down the information and make it more basic because we live in a, in a time and in an environment where, where we're supposed to think that inflation is good and they keep it at that 2% level and we sort of understand that, you know, um, we're supposed to consume, we're supposed to go into debt, that's all okay, that's actually good for the economy it provides demand and it keeps the 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 cycles going but you know when you peel back the layers and start to learn you actually find out that that's not the best thing for our economy was um was bitcoin your first formal investment or prior at least career like most people did you have 401k based investments or yeah, so I, um, I, I really wish I could, you know, knock myself over the head and talk to my younger self because I come from an immigrant family who, like so many Americans here, I was just taught to save, and I didn't, I didn't learn the stock market. I didn't understand how to invest. Um, I, you know, I pursued journalism, so that's definitely not one of the classes that I had grow, going to school, and I did not really invest until I started learning about Bitcoin. I had literally money as a melting ice cube in a bank account uh, or a credit union, you know, money market, all that standard and in a 401k. And now it just, I think back because like I was always a really good saver, guys. I think back on how much I could have like actually invested into Bitcoin a long time ago <laughs> because I was always so, you know, when you're an immigrant, you're like paranoid that the next day the rug could be pulled out from under you and everything exactly. could be gone in an instant. And so you just like, you you stash stuff away. Like I come from a family where, you know, you, you stuff things in the mattress. <laughs> so, yeah. um, so I, think I was all three always- of us are first gen, so. Oh, we, awesome. We share the sentiment. Yeah, so I, I definitely was someone who was a good saver, um, but in the wrong way. I didn't know how to invest, yeah. So I guess it's safe to assume that any of those uh, traditional investments you did have, you've already moved on to uh, Bitcoin, I assume? Yes, yeah. So I, <laughs> yeah, no, I'll, I'll totally share. You know, I started learning, and, and I think I've mentioned this on other shows, and certainly I agree with others who, who, who share this sentiment as well. When you learn about Bitcoin, you, you get like, you, you know, you touch it once, you're exposed to it once, and, but you don't, you don't know everything you need to know, and you're not, you don't have the conviction that you have at, the more that you're exposed to it, the more you learn about it. So you kind of start slowly and you allocate a little bit. And I definitely at that time, it was like a little bit of Bitcoin, a little bit of other things, a little bit of stocks, a little bit of, op like I traded options when I learned about options, uh, which was a very bad mistake, guys. I, I got greedy and I should have <laughs> sold my SPY calls when I, when I, when they went up like 90%. <laughs> um, Those are the lessons. But yeah, I funneled down, I funneled down, and I came down to, to, to Bitcoin. And it's funny, I think about all the the money I could have had if I hadn't risked and just, you know, got, I guess it's, you know, being greedy or wanting that higher return or, um, you know, trying to basically play the casino. I should have just put it into Bitcoin and waited. <laughs> we all have to, if you don't go through the cycles, that's not how you're going to yeah. win, right? So, yeah, yeah right. unrealized gains there, so it's okay. <laughs> Um, I'll let Joelle do some some here. Okay, I did have one question because this came out today, so I wanted, and every I'm not sure if people have seen, but I actually saw this on Blockworks and got a little excerpt from the executive order from President mm -hmm. Biden. So. His order calls for a coordinated and comprehensive approach to digital asset policy. He also, in his executive order, mentions that the U.S. must maintain a technological leadership in this rapidly growing space. What are your thoughts on the executive order? Do you think it's just a lot of jargon? Do you think that this is a good step forward? Like what? Just very curious. Yeah, so I definitely think it's better than it could have been and what a lot of our fears were. That's why we saw, I think, the spike in Bitcoin's price, right? Because especially given the geopolitical issues that are happening and sort of the the negative narrative surrounding Bitcoin and, you know, undermining sanctions and all that, I was actually expecting it to be a little bit more of a bearish <laughs> executive order. Um, so look, I, I see both sides. I, I do think it's great that America is acknowledging that we have to be competitive um, in, this, in this sector and we have to embrace it and we have to look at it and, and regulate it in a, in a smart, fair way. 
But at the same time, it's there. There's no. It, it doesn't provide some sort of silver bullet that all of a sudden we're going to adopt Bitcoin and everything will be great as we, as us Bitcoiners, you know, envision our future. I think we're, we should be very, very wary and skeptical of the central bank digital digital currency. Which honestly, the executive order talked more about CBDC than anything else. And it, I don't think it ever actually said the word Bitcoin. You know, it, everyone's still lumping everything into this cryptocurrency bubble or umbrella. And I I think I've always thought, you know, we need to educate the public because the two are not the same. The altcoins are not forms of money that can repair the damage that's been done to our economy over decades. Bitcoin is a potential global reserve asset. I mean, it's just, it's two completely different things and people should invest how they want. And I'm a total, I'm a free market, you know, believer, free market capitalist. So invest, invest in whatever altcoins you want, you know, lose money, <laughs> make money, go for it. Put it into Bitcoin if you make money. Um, but so, but, but, you know, I do at the same time see that if they do regulate it in a fair smart way that we could see more adoption because we just we really do need more of those traditional avenues we need a spot ETF we we probably need that in order to see some of the price discovery that we wanted or expected to happen last year so you know it's like I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic um, but then we have you know Senator Warren already coming out with a tweet responding to it saying like yes you know this highlights that the US is recognized all the risks that come with these, you know, the illicit activities that come with digital assets. And it's like, come on, honey, like we're trying to educate you. You're not responding. Like I've tweeted at her a million times. I'm, I'd be happy to go into her office and orange pill her anytime she wants. She wants. Um, so, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm going to I'm curious to see what happens as they study, quote unquote, study digital assets and how to regulate them. And we have to wait and see. On that note, let me jump in real quick. Th that studying could, should, and what happens if the U.S. government tries to uh, fork or imitate a deflationary type cryptocurrency that's programmatically fixed uh, in supply and uh, predictable mints, kind of like Bitcoin or maybe even a Monero where it doesn't ever hit uh, no more minting, but it gets pretty close to zero. Um, this, do you, what happens or should they, could they try and implement some system like that? I don't see any way that our <laughs> government or any politician would create a finite form of money that that's somewhere down the road someone can inflate. I'm sorry, maybe I'm still jaded from my reporting career, but at some point someone's going to want to finance something. Someone's going to want to take that prerogative to uh, to make more. So I just I, okay. I just don't see it. <laughs> okay. You once tweeted, Natalie, that we have too many old people in the office and not enough Bitcoiners. And you're not wrong there. You're yes. not wrong. Well, so then we, who would? Oh, no, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, I mean, the amount of sept septuagenarians in Congress, it, it really should make people concerned because especially when it comes to embracing a new technology, I'm sorry, but younger people are going to get it first. And so we really do. We really need some fresh energy in there. And I think what's frustrating is it would be one thing if it, you know, age is just a number and you could actually, you could be in your seventies and be like, yeah, I'm into Bitcoin. I love it. I want to embrace it. I feel young. I act young. Hey, I'm, I'm all for those kinds of politicians, but unfortunately that's not what we see. We see people who are stuck in their ways. They're very rigid in the establishment. Um, they are yeah. driven more by, by money and getting reelected. And look, we have people in office 20, 30, 40 years. The problems are getting worse. And it's like, why don't you just step down? Maybe, maybe retire in Florida and let someone else take over and try something different because it's not working. And meanwhile, some of them are like, you know, trading stock options and making a bunch of money. It's ridiculous. And it's led to, I think, yeah. a breakdown of trust in the, the political system. Do you, would you, or I should rephrase this, who in the Bitcoin community do you think could run for office that's already quite vocal or a personality in the space? C like could or people who I think might run for office? Um, well. maybe might. Okay, so uh, CJ Wilson. CJ Wilson, he's really active with the Bitcoin Coalition and he, like, I, I'm just so impressed by his work because he's not only very articulate and he's a great public speaker on Bitcoin and great advocate, but he's really done his homework and he now is going out to policymakers and to politicians' offices and he is spreading the word of Bitcoin and really going one step further to cater the message depending on 
what the party is and sort of what the what the needs of the constituents of a certain politician are, which I find to be just incredible work and 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 much needed work. And I can tell he's so passionate about politics. So I think if there was any Bitcoiner that I could see actually putting his hat in the ring, it would be CJ, um, which I, 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 I would totally advocate for. I think he's fantastic. Um, I think we're lucky to have, you know, Senator Lummis, who I got to hear speak at the Bitcoin Ski Summit in Wyoming. She was fantastic. I wish we could, you know, replicate her and replicate Ron Paul and, and some of these Thank folks that. that seem so much more common sense driven and, and more driven by like a libertarian point of view that to me is actually more centrist because we're, we're getting into so many extremes in this country. Um, and then who else? I mean, you know, Dennis Porter, I could maybe see running because he's <laughs> always talking about politics. Um, but I don't know. Yeah, we really do need to support, you know, like the bigger names and let them know that we do think this because we need those people to step forward. Um, I think Alberto had some questions um, on or I'll let you speak. <laughs> more more economics. Um, yeah. We'll get past this week, don't worry. Uh, is this whole oil quote unquote crisis FUD? The oil crisis? No. Yeah, I, do you think that's more FUD or an actual issue? No, I, I actually think uh, we are at sort of a turning point where I think it was maybe Marty Bent or someone tweeted that Putin essentially put a gun to to the, the US dollar as reserve currency with, with these actions. And I want to be cautious because I am not a geopolitical expert and the history of this conflict and how this crisis developed is so, so nuanced. So I try to not, you know, get into the speculation and some of the narratives that are that are out there because at the end of the day, like war is so tragic and terrible and there are innocent people dying and suffering and I am actually really inspired by my home country Poland which has really stepped up to help so many of these refugees and you know I just I, I hope that these these families are able to um, you know to, to create a new life for themselves and it inspires me that for those who know about Bitcoin potentially they were able to take their life savings with them and, and cross the border and escape with with some of their you know mo monetary value. Um, but the whole thing, you know, it's just, I think it's putting a really big spotlight on the fact that we have corrupted our system through, uh, through our money printing and our debt spiral. The U.S. dollar is global reserve currency. I think that the, the, the days are now numbered potentially, unless maybe, I don't know, maybe the Bitcoin standard for, for the U.S. could help with that. But clearly, um, other countries want to undermine it, and they've been working to prepare themselves to be able to do so. They've been putting other assets in their reserves. They've been moving, shifting over back to gold. Um, and it really, you know, it really does make you question, like, what is the dollar worth now? And what is our strength as a sort of superpower? Um, because now you look at our dollar, and to me, when I think about the U.S. dollar, I think, wow, it's backed by a whole lot of debt and the threat of violence because we've yeah. we've beefed up this very powerful military. And like, I don't want, I don't want that. I don't want a war. I think most of the people don't want a war. I think the people in Russia don't want war. They just want to be able to survive. What do we all want? We want to be able to take care of our, our families and save for the future. So, you know, it's just, it, it makes me really sad. I, I don't know how this is going to play out and I don't see it. I just, I think that Putin has such a mission that I don't see it de-escalating. And, um, and I think that the, the, this, the stage is set for setting up new a new monetary system and new payment rails and I don't think that Putin is going to embrace Bitcoin because I think just like she in a way he wants to control the monetary system in his country you know he wants that control and that prerogative over his citizens so I don't see it being Bitcoin but you know I do think that this showcases the use the the need and the use case for Bitcoin on a global stage. It's clear that you host a podcast because I feel like you're just perfectly segueing from one of my questions to the other. So, um, I have a question. It's kind of a curveball, and I guess you can take it outside of just the U.S. But we'll start with the U.S. Where do you think gold fits in in the U.S.'s playbook for future monetary policy? Given that we already see other countries uh, jump in at least to gold first as uh, for their way of exiting the dollar. Yeah, well, so I definitely think that people are going to flee to gold as a safe haven, especially because Bitcoin is still so young and still so new, right? I mean, this is a $1 trillion asset. 
and not even anymore, uh, compared to what a 10, 11 trillion dollar asset. And um, most treasury, you know, but treasuries and, and the bond market is still really the king of our, our whole financial system and what underpins it. So I, I, I'm not really sure. I mean, I definitely, what I will say is I definitely don't see us going back to a gold standard. You know, I know it's what Peter Schiff wants, but <laughs> look, I think those days are behind us. Um, and at this point, I just don't see, like, I mean, what could we do to repeg the dollar to go? Like, I, I don't see it. However, we, we do have gold reserves. Um, I, you know, I, I'd be interested to know if the U.S. has a strategy going forward to increase those reserves the way that Russia has over the past more than a decade. But I just, you know, for me, especially because I know so much about Bitcoin and I believe that this is the future and I, I truly think we need to kind of modernize and embrace and start to walk onto this digital monetary system that we're creating. I just don't see what gold's place is other than, you know, being this this old ancient store of value that you can't transport very easily and you can't verify it very easily. And it has all these qualities that, you know, that that Bitcoin fixes, essentially. And I, I really think that Bitcoin will eventually be the future. But obviously, the U.S. will also try central bank digital currency strategy and potentially UBI through that. Um, but at this point, you know, the big question for me is how do we fix the dollar? Because it's weakened so, so much and other countries are taking advantage of that weakness. Yeah, I know Latin American countries are just looking for an avenue to get out of the dollar because mm -hmm. it's just kept the entire continent, so uh, Latin America and Southern America, uh, pretty much under the thumb of the dollar. Yes. Yeah. Well, switching gears a little bit, um, we had a question uh, that we wanted to ask you, Natalie. We saw that you once tweeted, I've never sold a single SAP. Um, and with that in mind, we were curious because we're, we love DeFi. So we were curious if you have, if you're not selling your Bitcoin, have you ever thought about leveraging it, like using tools like Aave, for example? Uh, um, okay, so I am just, <laughs> I'm so conservative when it comes to my Bitcoin. Like I, I really, I accumulate, I dollar cost average, and then I put in cold storage. And I, you know, by the way, guys, like I'm late to the game and I, as a little reporter, did not have enough money to put in a bunch. So I'm not, people think I, you know, just because you have a podcast or you're a voice in this space that you're like a bajillionaire on Bitcoin. That's not the case, people. So um, I'm just very, very wary of, of my Bitcoin. And I do have concerns about how some of these websites, the exchanges will be regulated. I'm one of the, the believers that, you know, especially in the last couple of weeks, it's put a, a big spotlight on how uh, the government and centralized authorities could try to seize or freeze your accounts and that's that's a very big danger and so I'm a big believer in you know taking custody and learning how to be um, self-sovereign with your Bitcoin so I I, I knew, I'm sure I'm listening you know missing out on some yield but I, I just I safely store my my Bitcoin accumulation and I have not ventured into that space as much as I know a lot of other people have. Well, you know that uh, at EDGE, our like entire, uh, I guess, mission statement is, you know, being in control of your assets and self-custody. And I know Alberto has a lot to say about that as well. <laughs> uh, sure. Um, <laughs> I was listening. So uh, I guess the idea of being, or, you know, with, with accumulation, uh, what the end game would be, um, I guess some of us here in the office, for example, the DeFi protocols they're involved in are uh, decentralized and essentially self-sovereign, like you're saying, because our whole mission here is to make everyone their own bank. Um, and in your own bank, you have all your safety deposit boxes, which is every individual wallet you create, and only you have the key. Uh, that being said, though, at some point, especially some of us uh, who are completely out of the dollar, uh, have to find ways to participate in the current system still. So your options are either to sell your Bitcoin or uh, get a loan on it, which is a non-taxable event, not financial advice. And then you can use that um, that uh, stable coin cashed out to a dollar uh, and, and continue you know, paying bills or whatever. And you didn't have to get rid of that asset. Kind of like I think traditionally in wealth building, it's called uh, borrow, buy, die or something like that. You, you, buy, you buy assets by leveraging current assets. Uh, you Sure, you've accumulated debt, but the asset uh, gains outperform the debt 
and then they die and it gets put in a trust that gets handed off to the next generation of family members and the cycle just continues. Um, yeah, so and, and one fun fact about Edge is everyone at our company has been getting paid in Bitcoin since Edge was Airbits, like prior to Airbits turning into Edge. So people at our company are always trying to find like creative ways because they don't want to sell their Bitcoin, you know, it's mm -hmm. that same um, idea. So yeah, just we were curious to see what you had to say. But I do totally come from the school of fear. Like I don't, I don't enjoy the word leveraged or the, even the idea of being over leveraged. And I right. feel that could, that could pollute the exact system we're trying to get away from by mm -hmm. just bringing that right back in. But I get that. How else are you? What's then what's the end game, I guess? You know? Well, I, I will say that I definitely am a candidate for learning more about how to borrow against your Bitcoin because I listened to this fascinating interview uh, probably you know two or three months ago between Safedine and Michael Saylor, and they were discussing that a little bit and how you know you could per essentially you know maybe borrow against your Bitcoin to buy a house. And my my dream is to be able to afford a house, to be able to be a millennial with a house uh, and some real estate someday hey, that I call my yes. own. <laughs> so um, that's good. certainly something I think about for sure. Okay. Well, outside of, um, you know, coin stories, are, is there any projects that you are thinking to build in the future? Uh, that's a great question. You know, for me right now, the priority is just getting the word out to as many people as possible about Bitcoin and helping them understand it and sort of hold their hand down the rabbit hole. Because one thing that I hope, um, you know, people acknowledge and, and um, and maybe can empathize with is it's not really easy because there's so much information out there. Even though Bitcoin is kind of niche and there's a it's a smaller community certainly than than others and other industries, it's still. I mean, if you Google Bitcoin or go to go on YouTube and try to search Bitcoin, it's like where do you start, right? It's very right. intimidating. Um, you know, like Safedine's book, I actually had to read it probably three times to really fully understand it because some of the concepts were just so new to me and and aspects of it are so so technical and require a lot of historical context. So, you know, I feel for people because for me, I I was already, you know, being a journalist, this is sort of just what I do. I research things and I, I have sort of that time and that hunger and thirst. But for the average person who has a nine to five job or, you know, works even longer than that and is trying to and has kids and has to has all these responsibilities how do you condense that information and and I really think about that every time I have a news hit and I go on one of these programs and I have maybe 90 seconds or two minutes to distill the message of Bitcoin like I really take that to heart because it's like maybe someone's distracted or working in their kitchen but like they hear me and I say something that resonates with sort of like that 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 universal need for us to be able to make our lives better, improve ourselves, move up socially, move up in terms of our economic freedom and and an ability to to hold value. So, um, so I just that's my mission. And whatever I can do, whatever companies I can partner with in order to make that happen, I'm trying to do. Um, I'll have some more video content coming out that I'll announce soon. So, just a lot of exciting things. I'm working way too much. I need a break. Uh, but I'm also, I've never felt more fulfilled and felt like I'm really living out my calling. That's beautiful. That's probably the most important part and probably where you uh, draw most of your energy from, I assume. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I guess on a user level type of question, you said you use a hardware or cold storage. Um, I'm sure that means that at some point you still need to use a digital version of something. What is your favorite functionality features out of uh, a wallet? Favorite functionality? I mean, I just, I'm a, a big believer in making sure your Bitcoin is secure. So um, the wallets, the two wallets, and I actually got attacked for this on Twitter, but um, I've, I actually have used <laughs> two of the most popular wallets and I put out a question like, which one do you guys prefer? And I got so many nasty comments. <laughs> um, but I personally, personally have used Trezor and Ledger. And I like them both. Um, and I thought that they were simple. And um, you know, if you guys want to come at me in my DMs and tell me something else is way better, <laughs> like let me know. You know, I'm open to changing my mind. I'm not, you know, I'm not that rigid. Uh, but so those those are my favorite as far as cold storage. And then for exchanges, you know, it's it's really interesting because that is a journey in and of its own, right? Like I I entered into the space through Coinbase because I had a friend who um, his friend worked there, and so that's that was my introduction and. 
I had I didn't hear about any others. Um, but since then, I've I've shifted, and there are two places, two exchanges that I love, and they are OKCoin, which I first heard about through Safedean and his podcast, um, and now I'm grateful that they sponsor my show. So OKCoin is one of them, and Swan Bitcoin, and I dollar cost average through Swan as well. So um, so those are my my favorites. Well, you know, you're talking to Edge, so we want you to use Edge. (laughs) We'll we'll bring you on to the Edge side when you come to the the event here in person. You know, it's so interesting, like, how many there are. And, like, I definitely definitely don't know. I definitely don't know all of them. So, for sure, you know, I'd love to learn. Um, Okay, I'll take the next question. Sorry, guys. We have a list of a bunch of questions we wanted to ask Natalie today. Um, So we're going to switch gears now, talking about uh, the meetup coming up. So thank you again. Like we mentioned earlier, we're talking today because Natalie's coming to the EDGE headquarters um, at the end of the month on March 22nd. We're super stoked to have you here. But we were wondering, do you attend meetups usually? Is this a little different? I know you go to conferences, so we were just curious. Yes, um, I try to go to as many meetups as I can. There's a really strong community of Bitcoiners in Los Angeles where I live right now. And so um, there's Crypto Connect, which was created by Haley Lennon, who's amazing and she's a friend in the space. So I, I went to some of those events. There's um, there's like a meetup every Sunday. I've, I, I, couldn't go, I can't go every Sunday, but there's a great Bitcoin meetup on Sundays here in LA. So I go to that. Um, I've planned one before around a, a birthday of a Bitcoiner. We're actually, um, Swan is is actually going to start having some events in LA so stay tuned because I'll definitely be posting about that but yeah I love going to events I'm honored to be a guest at yours um, the San Diego community is one that I I would like to get to know more because my my boyfriend is there so I'm excited to to get to get the chance to meet more Bitcoiners that we could potentially both hang out with so yeah uh, you'll yeah, have to bring great. him to you'll have to bring him as well um, oh absolutely and- yeah we have, I think, about like two meetups per month. So he he'll have like a new community and friends to hang out with, and it, it's a very fun fun group. Prior to working at Edge, I worked in fashion. I never really got into like the meetup scene, and now working in crypto, it's just been amazing to see like this community grow in San Diego. So very thankful for that. Yeah, I'm super become, excited. We've become the hub. I guess for all the the meetups and stuff, people book their events here, even though it's. <laughs> yeah, and our space is free to use, so we just invite all like crypto meetups to meet here. It's awesome. been really fun for sure. You know, there's so um, much energy and like the the community aspect of it. I love that, uh, and I I cannot wait for the Bitcoin conference. And if you haven't gotten your ticket yet, make sure to get it. Um, Coin Stories code for 10% off. Uh, but I just can't, I can't wait because you guys, like, I, I, I will tell you a funny story. And this is just, this is what reinforces my belief that the community of Bitcoin is so awesome and so strong and powerful. I, I literally did Coin Stories as like a passion project. I thought nothing would happen with it. I just wanted to kind of pivot my current pod or my previous podcast, Career Stories, and focus on Bitcoin because I had grown so passionate about it. And I literally like started to collect these interviews and went to the Bitcoin conference with these like little business cards that had a like a QR code link to my podcast. I knew nobody. I went with my best girlfriend. We could not get into any party because everyone was like, you're not on the list. Who are you? We don't know who you are. <laughs> And I would just hand out my business card and be like, hey, this is a Bitcoin show, like listen to it, whatever. I walked up to Michael Saylor but backstage with my business card being like, hi, I'd really like to talk to you for my show. <laughs> and by the way, it worked. Um, I paid like $500 to go to Safedine's carnivore dinner to beg him to be on my show. Also worked. Oh. Um, and so like I, you know, I kind of, you know, crawled onto the stage as, as a baby Bitcoiner um on the scene i mean with 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 this podcast and here i am a a year later and you guys want me to come visit like i I just think it's crazy what can happen in a year if you focus on something you truly love and believe in and have passion for and i'm just so grateful because that wouldn't have happened without the support of the community so i mean bitcoiners are just amazing yeah that i i mean i think we could both attest to that alberta we joined about the same time like at edge so it's been a wild ride for us as well um but we're actually going to bitcoin 2022 so you'll have to uh, come by our booth i'm taking 10 employees this year so there's going to be a big crew of us there so we're really stoked 
I saw you're hosting a Women in Bitcoin networking brunch. Could you tell um, our audience about that? Yes. Um, super grateful and a big shout out to Alex Svetsky, who's one of my favorite Bitcoin voices. Um, he helped me plan it. And basically, it's just an opportunity to get together and network with one another. And we're going to feature some leading voices in the space that I admire and, and, and I'm grateful to be able to share um, the, the invitation with. It's Stacy um, of Max and Stacy, of course, and uh, and Lynn Alden and Stacy. Um, I'm going to mispronounce her last name, but she's with uh, Led. And so uh, we basically had like a couple of uh, ideas thrown around where we just wanted to encourage more more females to get together and and be able to meet one another as sort of a kickoff event to the conference. Because one thing that I will say is last year I was there with my girlfriend and it was difficult to find other women. And, and we didn't know anybody in general. Um, I mean, I, bre I, sort of, I sort of knew the people I had interviewed for my podcast, but not really, I'd never met them in person. And there'd be like a line out the door for the men's bathroom and there'd be like five girls inside the girls bathroom you know <laughs> and uh and so there's just there's just a very apparent um you know gender gap and for me I'm look I believe Bitcoin is for everyone and I love the inclusivity and like it doesn't matter what your gender your race your you know your age whatever every Bitcoin is for everyone and I totally acknowledge and get that but at the same time I've always been a girl's girl like I love being with other women I love supporting other women I think it's really important and I personally love being a woman like I'm proud of it I'm proud to be a woman I don't want to you know hide that and like act like oh gender doesn't matter at all so um, so for me it was just about connection and community and networking and being able to have a place where we can meet each other and then head off to the conference and you know find a familiar face maybe you know maybe support each other in our different endeavors and so we're holding it on April 6th it's going to be from 11 a.m. to 1 30 um, I'm going to be announcing the tickets soon they're donation based so they're they're free but the um, donations will go to the Unilove Foundation which helps educate orphans in El Salvador and I'm really just really excited about the event. And uh, so watch for my watch for some tweets about how you can get tickets, because I think they will go fast since there's a very limited capacity. Yeah, I'd love to get some for the ladies that are coming on the trip. So really stoked about that. Um, and before we wrap things up, I know we might have some questions, but I just wanted to ask about South by Southwest. You're attending. Uh, who are you excited to see? Uh, what are the talks that you're excited to like, learn more about? I saw that there's uh, topics on NFTs, crypto, token economics. So it looks like that category is really being built out there. So we're just curious. Well, you know, I'm a Bitcoin maxi, so <laughs> <laughs> um, I, so this is my first time at South by Southwest, and it's a very quick trip for me. I'm actually going to be on a panel um, for Abra and their show Money Talks. So I'm going to be on a panel with um, Bill, the CEO, and Dan Held, who's obviously a big voice in the space, and Peter McCormick. So I'm very excited to just talk to them, not only about Bitcoin, um, and Bill has a lot of really interesting perspectives on just invest uh, institutional investors coming in. He was the latest guest on what Bitcoin did with Peter McCormick, so everyone check that out. Um, but we're going to be talking also just about the macroeconomic environment, inflation, what we think the Fed's going to do, Russia and Ukraine. Um, so we're going to be hitting a lot of topics that'll be really interesting. We go on stage at noon um, in Austin for the event. And then I'm just curious, like, what the experience is like, because I've heard so many great things about South by Southwest, and it's fascinating to see how much crypto is now a part of that, <laughs> the, the event, and so much is, uh, is surrounding this new technology and, and industry because I remember years ago people talking about going and it was mostly about music I think <laughs> um, so it'll be great to see and experience and I wish I had more time there yeah you're definitely going to be a great uh, representative of the, the community so thanks for doing that talk for everyone um, Garrett do you want to bring in any um, of our audience that may have some questions for Natalie Yeah, bringing up the first speaker. Hey there, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, yes. wonderful. Hi, Natalie. Uh, super excited to kind of hear uh, this Twitter space. And I'm uh, Ginny. I'm a part of the marketing team at Edge. Uh, I do a lot of the design work. And um, my question here is, can you tell us a little bit more about the local scene in El Salvador? It seems that you uh, visited recently, and I was just curious to know you know, with uh, President Bukele um, uh, starting or 
making Bitcoin legal tender, first of all, and also um, starting the initiatives with uh, Bitcoin City and uh, Chivo Pets, the vet clinic and such. I would just I just wanted to know how the developments are going when you visited and just kind of wanted to learn more about that. Yeah, that's a great question, and it's so nice to meet you. Um, my trip to El Salvador was amazing and really, really inspiring. Um, I visited Bitcoin Beach, that's where I stayed, and had the opportunity to see how immersed Bitcoin already is in that economy. And what was actually really funny is I was down there for interviews and essentially to do some documentary style content, and I thought that everyone would be very excited to talk about you know, Bitcoin and how different or new it is. And honestly, they, it's been so ingrained in that local community for so long now that they were honestly bored talking about it. It's just part of their lives now, which I think is actually really exciting. They d they, they just, they use it, they're comfortable with it, they understand it. Um, that being said, the one thing I learned that was interesting was they still see it as, um, they see it as more of a currency as opposed to a store of value because they traditionally are not used to kind of a savings account the way that we are here in the United States. They don't see it really as a store of value. They live more hand to mouth and they haven't been able to really plan for their future because of the economic situation in their country. You know, before the El Salvador dream was like my family, the American dream to come to the U.S. to be able to send money back. Um, the there was women, there were women that I met who are young, young professionals or young moms who said that you know basically if you have a relative that went to the U.S. and sent back money, that's how you were potentially able to go to university. Like it just didn't happen. P people basically start working right after. Um, you finish, you know, secondary school and life has almost felt sort of like it used to be very cyclical, like you didn't think too far into the future because economically that wasn't feasible. And now with Bitcoin being introduced, they are thinking about the future a lot more. They're 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 hearing and inspired by the fact that the president and major voices within, you know, the Bitcoin space are saying, hey, El Salvador could potentially be the new Singapore and there's going to be so much investment and capital and innovation and technology, like everything's coming here and, and, um, and there's a potential to create new businesses and become entrepreneurs. And so I went to a place called Hope House where, again, I met these women that were in their late teens to early 30s. And for the first time, they're like trying to figure out ways to start businesses and trying to figure out what the needs of the community are in, or, or in order to grow it and in order to flourish and help their families. And they're asking, you know, how do they present themselves on camera because people are now starting to ask them for interviews more or they're getting opportunities to showcase their businesses online. And like really at the, at the, at the foundation of all of that is just this feeling that they all now have hope they like think about the future in a way that they never did before. Um, and that was really inspiring to me, that they now dream not of coming necessarily to the US, but actually of making an, an amazing life in El Salvador. I thought that was beautiful. Um, now, is this transformation happening overnight? Certainly not. Um, the women still kind of don't understand the, 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 the real, you know, programming of Bitcoin, how it works, why it's scarce, how it was developed, like that, that education still needs to spread. And there are many, many efforts ongoing there to spread that knowledge. Um, and I will say in San Salvador, the capital, uh, when I went, fewer merchants are accepting Bitcoin, fewer people know about it than in a place like Bitcoin Beach, where the, the mission is sort of accomplished, that Bitcoin's uh, kind of integrated in the economy. So there's still work to be done, but I was inspired. And literally everyone I asked on my trip, from drivers to uh, pupusa makers to you know <laughs> grocery store workers, everybody that I asked, hey, what do you think of Bukele? Not one person said something bad. They're really excited about all of this. So I know that there are, there are narratives out there saying, oh, he's a dictator, he's this, he's that. Well, I, I certainly did not meet anyone that said that to me. Wow. That's amazing. Thank you for sharing. And um, it's good to see that what how he's, I guess, how he's portrayed online on Twitter and how sometimes he um, trolls people and uh, just having the human aspect of it, it, it shows. And um, yeah, uh, awesome. Yeah. Thank you for so much for sharing. Yeah, thank you for the question. Well, we're going to leave it at that. So thank you so much, Natalie, for joining us today. Thank you guys so yeah, much. I'm I'm just super inspired whenever I, you know, connect with more Bitcoiners. Um, and I'm just, again, I'm, I'm super grateful. Can't wait to visit um, for your meetup. And uh, yeah, looking forward to it.
Great. Thank you guys so much. Thanks, guys. Adios.